Tonight, a dire picture of this country's housing crisis. Canada needs millions more homes. Is the government doing enough? Canadians are struggling right across the country. Popular cold medicine, experts say a key ingredient doesn't work. There's, no, there's nothing that these drugs do that's special or magical. Is it time to take them off the shelf? And when there's no escaping the heat. This is just too flippin' hot. A national investigation reveals Canadians living in dangerous conditions. When you actually see the proof of it, it's alarming. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. For so many Canadians, housing affordability is an urgent issue. They need solutions right now, but new data released just as the federal Liberals are gathering at a retreat shows we aren't building enough homes to ease that pressure anytime soon. To increase affordability, you need to increase supply. But according to a new report, we're facing a serious gap. Canada needs to build nearly 3.5 million more homes than already expected by 2030 to bring those costs down. That gap has narrowed slightly from last year, and today the government pledged some money to build more homes. But as Ashley Burke shows us, the issue is heaping pressure on a party and a prime minister struggling in the polls. The prime minister on a job site, trying to show he's at work tackling one of the biggest issues people are facing. Canadians are struggling right across the country, uh, and that's why we're responding. Justin Trudeau in London, Ontario, announcing $74 million in federal funding for the city to fast track building more than 2,000 homes. The government calling on other cities to apply too. A new standard has been set and we have new expectations. We want you to build houses near transit. We want you to build houses near campuses. But the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation now says about 3.5 million more new homes will be needed by 2030 on top of what's already planned to help crack the housing crisis. London's mayor says this deal will help his city's needs. Before um, the pandemic, we had about 300 um, individuals homeless or unsheltered on our streets. Today, we have about 2,000. The Prime Minister's in London meeting his caucus amid the worst polling numbers he's seen since taking office. Analyst David Coletto laid out his findings to some Liberals. Right now, if people were asked to make a choice, um, you'd probably lose the election. Um, and, and so, as you would imagine, the reaction to that isn't great. Some demonstrators outside continued their calls for Trudeau to step down, but no similar demand to Trudeau inside caucus. We're all united behind the Prime Minister, but again, it's not, uh, it's not a choir that sits behind singing all the time. We actually get out there and, and tell each other what we like, what we don't like, um, and it's, uh, it's like any family. I mean, there's some concerns that, that were raised and, and there's some changes that have to come, and, and I, I, I'm pretty sure they will, they will come. So, Ashley, that's what the ministers are saying publicly. What are you hearing, though, about that meeting behind closed doors? Well, Adrian, sources say that this was a frank conversation in that room and that one of the key concerns that was brought up was the need to counter Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, who is relentlessly attacking the Liberals on housing and affordability. One minister also said on camera that during the meeting, the prime minister listened and they're expecting him to do the talking tomorrow. All right, Ashley Burke in London. The number of E. coli cases connected to multiple daycares in Calgary has jumped again to 310. But officials say the number of sick children is decreasing. 21 remain in hospital, seven are on dialysis. Just yesterday, health inspectors revealed they found major health issues, including a cockroach infestation at a kitchen shared by the daycares. Turning now to the catastrophic flooding in the Libyan port city of Derna. In the words of one aid worker, bodies are everywhere. The reported number of dead now more than 5,000, more than 9,000 are still missing after a powerful storm on Sunday triggered the failure of two dams. Derna's mayor says based on the districts destroyed in the flood, the death toll may reach 20,000. Margaret Evans shows us as responders tally the loss in Derna some struggle to hold back tears. Colossal, the only word to describe the damage wrought by the floodwaters or the grief left in their wake. Yeah, yeah. Little mercy for the living left to collect their dead 
if they can find them. I already lost six people, says this man. We managed to take out three. We did not find the other three. These satellite images before and after the collapse of two dams near Derna show just how much of the city was ripped from muddy foundations. People swept away while sleeping, now given back by the sea. This is destiny, says this man. I lost my sister and her daughters. But for some, it was a tragedy that should have been avoided. We'd warned the authorities last week, no, for years, says this man, that the dam had cracks. A legacy first of the Muammar Gaddafi years, built in the 70s, and then of the power struggle that followed the dictator's fall. This is a country that is fractured between these rival systems, has made absolutely everything a nightmare to do. A UN-recognized government often accused of corruption in the West and a warlord backed by the likes of Russia in the East. A challenge for ordinary Libyans wanting to reach or send help to the flood zone. The bureaucratic red tape, the suffocating circumstances that are now there in eastern Libya are hampering the aid efforts. Help from outside is starting to arrive. But the need will only grow. Some 30,000 people displaced to be fed and housed. For now, the duty is still to the dead. The emotional toll of those doing the counting carried in the eyes of this doctor. Our families, our brothers, the figures are massive, he says. We belong to God, and to him we shall return. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Nearby Morocco is also reeling tonight because the death toll from Friday's earthquake is now believed to be nearly 3,000. <laughs> So as you can see, in the village of Imintala, an aftershock sent rescue crews scattering. Aid is finally tricking in, trickling into the hardest hit areas, but still hasn't reached many of the estimated 300,000 affected. The Canadian government is matching donations made to the Red Cross from Morocco over the next two weeks. Well, back here at home, people across the Maritimes are bracing for Hurricane Lee. Tonight, the storm is just off Bermuda, but it is heading north, triggering weather alerts in all three maritime provinces and parts of Quebec. While the brunt of the storm isn't expected until Saturday, people are already stocking up. And so clearly a busy day at this Costco as people lined up to buy water, generators and fuel, crucial supplies that hopefully won't be needed. Meteorologist Ryan Snodden is in Halifax. So, Ryan, can you take us through what we know tonight about how Lee is going to impact the Maritimes? Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. Uh, category 2 storm right now, it's already begun its turn northward, and that is key as it works its way north of Bermuda. It will transition and weaken to a Category 1 storm. Still expected to move into the Maritimes as a Category 1 storm on Saturday before transitioning to a post-tropical storm, but still packing a punch with rain, gusty winds, pounding surf, and the potential for storm surge. There were, are obviously going to be a lot of anxious people, you know, watching, given it's been almost a year since Fiona caused so much damage there. Yeah, absolutely. But what I've been reiterating the last couple of days, this will not be Fiona 2.0. Having said that, this will pack a punch. We need to be prepared. Heavy rain, potential for more than 50 millimeters, southwest Nova Scotia and across New Brunswick along the track of Lee, and the winds gusting upwards of 90 to 100 kilometers per hour or more best chances southwestern maritimes closest to the track these are the best potential for damaging winds widespread gusts 60 to 90. yeah i mean not the strongest winds but with the tree still in full leaf power outage worthy here for sure and keeping a very close eye on the storm surge potential with this one adrian that will come into greater focus over the next few days all right, meteorologist Ryan Snod in our Halifax newsroom. I feel like we'll be talking again. Absolutely. A small town in Newfoundland is in mourning tonight after a commercial fishing boat sank just off the coast. 
it's like we're all going around as zombies. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say to each other. It, it, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy for any community, but particularly a small community where everybody is so close-knit. Of the four crew members, two died, one was rescued, one is still missing. The Canadian Coast Guard and military continue to search, but they warn time is running out. And a tense 14-day manhunt in the U.S. is over tonight, and a convicted killer is back in custody. Paul Hunter now on the dramatic capture and the moments leading up to it. After all this time, there he is. That's him in the middle with disheveled hair and a Philadelphia Eagles sweatshirt held tight by those who'd finally captured him. The subject is in custody. Repeating, subject is in custody. Famously, crab walking out of a Pennsylvania County Jail two weeks ago, Danilo Cavalcante had been set to begin a life sentence for murdering his ex-girlfriend. Instead, leading authorities on a wild manhunt on the run in the wooded countryside for days. Caught on security cams and doorbell cams where he was seen clean shaven, once heard rummaging in a basement. Police blared from a helicopter an audio message from his own mother begging him to surrender, but he kept going. A van was stolen. Then word he'd taken someone's rifle all the while the hundreds of police on his trail came up empty until overnight a break. A burglar alarm went off. Then heat sensing cameras found him. When police moved in, he had no idea he'd been surrounded. That did not stop him from trying to escape. He began to crawl through thick underbrush, taking his rifle with him as he went. In the end, no shots were fired, and it was a police dog that took him down. Minutes later, in an unusual step, the team then posed with Cavalcante for a kind of victory shot. Our nightmare is finally over, and the good guys won. A view certainly shared by those who live nearby. When Cavalcante re-emerged later on, minus the sweatshirt, a crowd had gathered, some shouting at him, as he then began that long, delayed trip to state prison. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Russian officials say a barrage of Ukrainian missiles damaged two ships at a dry dock facility in occupied Crimea. So unverified video posted online appears to show some of the strikes. According to Ukrainian officials, they destroyed a landing ship capable of transporting hundreds of troops and an attack submarine dealing another blow to Russia's Black Sea fleet. And just as Russia sees more losses, it appears to be hunting for more support for the war, and it seems to have found it. Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un met for hours in Russia today. As Breyer Stewart tells us, while there's no official arms deal, there is a connection that concerns. As Kim Jong-un's armored train rumbled to a stop in Russia's Far East, the North Korean leader emerged. The visit was staged to show strong ties and the potential for the nuclear-armed countries to team up. Putin showed Kim and his entourage a Russian space launch facility, given North Korea's interest in rockets. Just one hour before the talks began, North Korea launched two short-range ballistic missiles. Over dinner, Kim toasted Comrade Putin. We're confident that the Russian army and people will win a great victory in the just fight to punish evil groups, he said. The leaders discussed agriculture, security and military cooperation. There were no specifics, but U.S. officials are troubled by the talks. We have concerns about any burgeoning defense relationship between North Korea and Russia. Both countries have denied U.S. claims that North Korea is selling Russia ammunition. But if there is a deal, North Korea's wish list could be long. Uh, North Korea is a heavily, heavily sanctioned country. Um, so outside of that, they might be interested in simpler things like food or, or hard cash. And then there are the optics of the visit. Experts say it's a chance for Putin to show that some leaders still want to meet with him. Kim's visit follows last week's meeting with Turkey's leader and a visit in the spring by China's president. 
everybody's coming. It's not, once again, not Justin Trudeau, but everybody who is, is you know, in his universe, they all coming uh, to kiss the ring. Kim is now apparently on his way back to North Korea, but will stop at a Russian defense factory along the way. One last signal of how the two leaders could be prepared to help each other. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Canada's military is facing surging demands at home and abroad, even as it struggles with recruitment and retention within its ranks. There simply aren't enough soldiers or sailors. David Common now with exclusive access on board HMCS Ottawa. He shows us the impact and the attempts at a solution. Canada's Navy is not big, so sending three ships to Asian waters is a major commitment, especially at a time when the entire military is so short of personnel. One in ten jobs in the forces is vacant. We're understaffed right now. We're heavily understaffed. And Sailor First Class Anton Parker backs one strategy to retain members. It's right there in his hair and mutton chop sideburns, a relaxation of decades-old dress standards in the hopes it'll incentivize people to stay. It was a happy moment. Uh, my mom saw me actually just before I deployed this year, and it's the longest my hair's ever been in my life. And then also, I get to wear a pretty cool mustache now. On board his ship, HMCS Vancouver, a fifth of all sailors are in training. One in 10 has been in the military less than two years, and a new recruiting program will soon see those with even less experience. Just a one-year commitment to try out a series of different roles in the Navy. Don't like it? Leave any time. To get military experience, to do a period of service, still be close to family and friends, um, and you know, it can be a bit of the try before you buy. The military has warned the situation is going to get worse as demands for the forces increase. Soldiers deployed along NATO's border with Russia, training Ukrainian soldiers, delivering ammunition and weapons for Ukraine, and near unprecedented demand at home to assist in wildfires, floods and disasters. Everyone is burnt out. Attracting new members made all the more difficult by high profile incidents involving the highest ranks. We have seen scandals related to discrimination and sexual misconduct, and that might deter them from joining the military. Of course, there is the sense of adventure that comes with military life. Deployments like this, though, can last four months for the crew of HMCS Ottawa. David Common, CBC News, somewhere in the Pacific. WestJet says it is revisiting its policy after the union representing cabin crew took issue with this. Who's ready for a home you can afford? Who's ready for some common sense? Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was allowed to speak over the PA system Sunday night on a flight largely full of people who had just attended the Conservative convention. The union calls it very disappointing that a politician was allowed to do so. WestJet says it was not a political endorsement. The United States is deciding whether to remove some common cold medicines from store shelves. There's nothing that these drugs do that's special or magical. But should Canada follow suit? Residents of Yellowknife are back after a wildfire scare and eager to return to normal. It's been a little bit cuckoo. And he's barely a teen, but he's already scored a major deal. Hi, this really is a dream come true. We're back in June. There's more promising news out of the Northwest Territories. Weeks after wildfires triggered evacuations, residents of Hay River could start returning home as soon as this weekend. Officials are eyeing Sunday as a possible return date for the general public. Essential workers have already been allowed back into town. Officials will meet again Friday to reassess the re-entry plan. And Yellowknife continues to reopen one week after the wildfire evacuation order was lifted, but not without challenges. As Julia Wong shows us, schools and hospitals are scrambling to get back up to speed. For Melody Shaw, it's been a journey to make it to the top of this playground mountain. It's been a little bit cuckoo. 
After weeks away, her family is back in Yellowknife and ready for a bit of normalcy. I'm looking forward to it for sure. Um, getting back to work and going to school is, is super important and we need a routine for sure. At this Yellowknife school, crews are scrambling to finish laying down flooring before students come back Thursday, a project put on hold during the evacuation. They're also checking on air filters as smoke from nearby wildfires continues to hang over the northern capital. We do have HEPA filters in pretty much all of the classrooms. Uh, we're going through trying to get filters changed with that and ordering new filters for them. Build those relationships with their kids as soon as they come in. On top of that, staff will be paying extra attention to how students may be feeling. Yeah, right now we're just focusing on really having a calm, um, relaxing start. What's really important is just to give the kids the space to talk about their own story. And it's not just schools. We're getting really close to our full service capacity. At Yellowknife's hospital, more inpatient beds have opened, and the emergency room and pediatric units are up and running. But labor and delivery is still suspended, and patients sent to Alberta and B.C. need to be flown back. What are the care needs of all of those people today? When is it safe in their medical trajectory to move them? It's one of the more high-risk devices. Staff have also been assessing equipment. We did the preventive maintenance check on all the anesthesia machines because electromechanical devices do not like sitting unused for three weeks. Uh, we checked out all the dialysis machines. Staffing levels are almost back to normal, but the hospital, normally bustling, is not quite there yet. The halls are empty and people are, are not around, and so it, it's a little bit eerie sometimes. It likely won't be eerie for too much longer. Officials say most services will be back up and running within 7 to 10 days, but it could be at least another three weeks before the hospital is completely back to normal. Julia Wong, CBC News, Yellowknife. Well, most schools may be back, but September is still bringing the heat. It's just too flippin' hot. A CBC News investigation reveals it could be worse indoors. If it's 26 outside, it's like 33 degrees inside. And some students return to full classrooms, but empty libraries. Taking away books is considered censorship. But first, U.S. health experts say a common decongestant doesn't work. Many of these drugs are not treating the underlying cause. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. The hard data on dangerous heat right where you live. It's like 33 degrees inside. All summer in 50 homes in five cities, our exclusive experiment revealed a silent killer. I sleep maybe two and a half hours, half an hour at a time. It can rob you of sleep, shorten your life. And your heart has to work harder. Even end your life. Here's Tara Carmen to show you what the heat sensors our investigative units supplied, measured, and to break down the risk to millions of Canadians. The heat, the humidity is sweltering. Sweltering heat today. There's been a heat warning. Heat warning has been issued by the health unit. 50 sensors, five cities, so many stories from a long, hot summer. Windsor, Ontario. Greg Walton was feeling extreme heat from day one. I've taken a shower. I'm already starting to wet my shirt. I'm sweating profusely. Vancouver, July 18th. Samantha Johnson was dreading the summer ahead. If I do too much, I just perspire. Just It just pours off me because it's so warm. Everywhere we measured, there were similar stories. It was like almost um, 10 p.m. at night. The temperature at this time is 31. We found that temperatures inside were often far hotter than outside. Many people tend to think that if they remain indoors, they're safe. The problem is, is that indoor environments can get really hot. Ottawa professor Glenn Kenny studies the body's ability to lose heat. Looking at your data, there's no question that we have to be concerned. His research found people can generally handle indoor temperatures up to 26 Celsius. Your body has to try to lose more heat and your heart has to work harder to try and enhance that heat dissipation. So as you get above 26, it becomes 
more stressful on the body. CBC's analysis found half the homes in our test were above 26 degrees most of the time. Let's have a look at the data. You've been, yeah, above 28 degrees, um, even at nighttime. I sleep maybe two and a half hours, half an hour at a time. It's just too flippin' hot. 79-year-old Samantha Johnson feels she has nowhere to go, day or night. I have heart failure, so as soon as I do any type of movement, the sweat just pours off of me. And so I could go to the library and I could stay there until 6 or 7, and then I could come back to this and not sleep all night, and then get up and go back to the library. Those politicians have got it all figured out, don't they? We also showed our findings to emergency doctor Aaron Orkin. The homes here are holding steady in the like 28, 29, uh, just shy of 30 degrees all the time uh, with almost no reprieve. Six weeks later, our sensors found that Greg Walton's apartment had the most stays over 26 degrees. Wow, like so it's like if it's 26 outside, it's like 33 degrees inside and I'm running fans and it's still that much hotter and it's still that much more humid and it's just like wow. But it has such a big difference on the quality of life and just the quality of experience that you're in when you're in your place. It's not safe and not, not good for your health to be in that kind of heat in an ongoing way period. That will be more dangerous for people who have other health conditions. But also it means that over time people who are exposed to heat in an ongoing way will have shorter life expectancy. The heat became a life and death matter for 88-year-old Herman Gron, one of our participants who lived here in Surrey, BC. He was in and out of the hospital with breathing problems. Days after we last spoke to him, Herman passed away on August 14th of heart failure. That's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy at so many different levels. People home who are suffering from heat-related illness back into a home setting that simply cannot cool down. The idea that medications or other treatments will fix their health problems, their uh, respiratory disease, as this gentleman felt uh, and experienced, or their, uh, their other health problems, that they'll be able to address those without getting the heat under control is equally absurd. Community advocate Marcia Bryan says now that the facts are in, it's time to act. Wow. <laughs> is this for real? To actually see the proof of it. Speaking is one thing, but when you actually see the proof of it, it's alarming. Hopefully with this will come something amazing out of it. Now that's alarming enough, but heat isn't the only hazard. CBC's investigative unit also tracked the humidity using precision sensors, just like this one. Leah Hendry breaks down the dangers when summer swelter knocks out your natural defenses. <laughs> Last week in Montreal, a heat wave brought hot, humid days. But when the sun went down, there was still no relief. And in eastern and central Canada, you have the added effect of humidity, which can keep buildings hot well into the night. It is currently 28.5 degrees in my apartment. We spoke to three of our 50 heat monitor volunteers about what the data said about that humidity effect. First up, Leah Raymond Marshall. It's roasting in her newly built student co-op that doesn't include air conditioning. As soon as you start trying to get to sleep, you can feel how hot you are. She says she could buy an AC unit, but it would block the access to her balcony. During last week's heat wave, the inside humidity was nearly 70%. It's like, you know when you open the oven, and you get the like burst of hot air. It feels like that, but all the time. Um, I'm hyper aware of how much I'm sweating right now. So this is our environmental chamber. Researcher so Danielle Gagnon has studied the added effect of humidity physiologically on the body. Our main defense mechanism to stay cool is to sweat. And what really cools us off is the evaporation of sweat. The more humid it is in the air, the harder it is for that process to occur. So we might still produce sweat, but instead of it evaporating, it'll drip off onto the floor, and then we lose all of its cooling power. What ends up happening inside of our body when we're not able to cool off? Our internal body temperature will increase more for a given environment. Um, that can obviously lead to dangerous things if, if body temperature increases to very high levels. There. Good. 
Bernadette Mamo lives with her 86-year-old mother in Toronto. Both of them have high blood pressure. We got the doctor's appointment on Friday. We can get out of this heat. They tried installing an air conditioner, but it blew the fuses in the old building her mother's been renting for more than 50 years. I worry about her getting heat stroke, even though she's not outside. The CBC heat monitors show that with the humidity, the evening temperature inside felt as high as 31 degrees. How does that make Mamo feel? Ugh. Maddening, aggravating. We're paying rent. I'd like to be able to stay in my home comfortably. But it's like we can't. In Raymond Marshall's apartment, with the humidity, it got up to 34 degrees. And that's not all. When we looked at the data, it was 10 degrees hotter in here at some point than it was outside. Okay. Meaning that it was 10 degrees cooler outside. Really? <gasps> I should, maybe I should start sleeping outside. <laughs> it's surprising too because you said your building was built in 2020. You know, when you make a building in Montreal, you think about how the, the cold is going to affect. Well, we should start thinking about how the heat is going to affect us. New buildings need to be designed so that they don't uh, store heat uh, in the summer. Dr. David Kaiser says the city's daytime cooling centres don't help people at night when the risk is the highest. If we want to be realistic and we're thinking about uh, reducing that risk at night, then it really comes down to uh, building, housing um, and uh, urban planning. Finally, when humidity was factored in, we clocked the apartment that felt the hottest of all in our project, and it belongs to... Hi, how are you doing? How are you? MBA student Sridharan Ben Kiparam. The humidity in your apartment was 70% one day in July, at the beginning oh, of July. Okay. And you actually, your apartment here reached the highest temperature of any of the other sensors that we oh, have okay. in Canada. It reached a temperature of feeling like about 39 degrees in here. That's pretty high. <laughs> what do you think about that? It's, it's really surprising, but then yeah, it's, it's really loud. I'm surprised I got through this. Now that Ben Kiparam has graduated, he's looking for a new apartment. For his quality of life, something with shade or better yet air conditioning will be a priority. So Tara, I'm curious about something. The federal government has a climate adaptation plan that aims to eliminate deaths from extreme heat by 2040. What's your sense of how realistic that is? Yeah, so my colleagues at What on Earth put that question to the federal environment minister, Stephen Gibo, and he said this is not something the federal government can do on its own because a lot of what needs to happen, like setting up systems to identify and check in on vulnerable people or changing building codes, is actually the responsibility of provinces or cities. So meeting that target depends how well everyone works together. And even with that, though, that target is still 17 years away. I mean, clearly there are people who need help right now. Yes, yeah, 17 years is a really long time. And Gibo says the target is 2040 because things like retrofitting all the buildings in Canada so that they don't overheat are expensive and take time. But it's clear we need to protect those who are vulnerable much sooner than that. So the federal plan notes extreme heat waves are the deadliest weather events in Canada. And we've just heard now that the BC government is proposing changes to the building code to require that new buildings have a room designed not to exceed 26 degrees. All right, Tara Carmen in Vancouver, thank you. And there's much more of Tara and her team's findings on cbcnews.ca. You can check that out and see how they did it. Next, some students return to school and find libraries half empty. Taking away books without anyone's knowledge is considered censorship. The fight to keep books on the shelves, next. school libraries stripped of books in the name of diversity. What sort of a library is left for my child? Many thrown out because they're more than 15 years old. Erasing history is what they're doing. Anne Frank and Harry Potter, two casualties of a literary purge. Angelina King broke the story that has everyone talking and the Ontario government taking action. She breaks down why a school board culled centuries of work and wisdom and simply threw it all away.
I did go to the fiction section of li my library and I saw this, empty shelves on the first day of school. And sections that have been completely erased. Raina Takata says more than half of the books at her Mississauga School Library are gone, including her favorites like Harry Potter and The Hunger Games. Taking away books without anyone's knowledge is considered censorship. CBC News has learned thousands of books have been removed within the Peel District School Board, many likely ending up in the landfill. Like most libraries in Canada, Peel schools are to weed out books that are damaged or outdated, but the board is going further. According to an internal document reviewed by CBC, books that aren't inclusive or reinforce racist content or stereotypes also have to go. That was put into place in response to a ministry directive, mandating the board undergo a diversity audit as part of a review on systemic discrimination within the board. But it appears that was misinterpreted. At first, neither Ontario's Education Ministry nor the Minister's Office would comment for the story. But after it was published, the Minister told CBC he told the board to end the process immediately. In a statement saying, Ontario is committed to ensuring that the addition of new books better reflects the rich diversity of our communities. It is offensive, illogical and counterintuitive to remove books from years past that educate students on Canada's history, anti-Semitism or celebrated literary classics. My son is in grade 10. Parent Tom Ellard says he thinks the school board misinterpreted the ministry's directive. Ellard and other parents and students are concerned with how the process has been unfolding. I'm not comfortable giving anyone the power to be the arbiter on a huge basis of what's right and wrong from a library's perspective about the totality of ideas that are available. Takata, who's Japanese, says she's worried books with themes of race like Japanese Canadian internment will disappear. It shows students that it never happened. At Takata's school and others, the process has led to confusion. Because staff are supposed to focus on weeding books published in 2008 or prior, it appears some have tossed nearly all books published in that time frame. I brought these two books, The Very Hungry Caterpillar and The Diary of Anne Frank. Diane Lawson says she spoke with teachers who are upset those books were removed, seemingly based on publication date alone. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Lawson and Ellard created a group called Libraries Not Landfills after they say teachers reached out in hopes they could raise awareness. It's important that those challenging ideas are there and available to us. If they're not there, how are we providing a learning environment for our children? The process itself are rolled out wrong. Trustee and school board chair David Green says after trustees learned about the process, they implemented changes in hopes of ensuring transparency and accountability. Now, if a book is tossed for not being inclusive, staff must record it. We want to make sure it's done properly, that all students feel included and part of the, the process. So I have talked to a few of my friends. But so far, they don't feel that way and our decisions and thoughts haven't been considered. I'm worried about like my chance with other students uh, when coming up to university that have access to all those books that I don't have. So Angelina, I am so curious, what is the school board saying about this? Well, we reached back out to the school board today after we heard from the minister to see if the board would adhere to his request to stop the process immediately. Didn't hear uh, back from the board on that one, but I previously asked the board several questions, things like how many books have already been thrown out, how much will it cost to replace them. The board didn't address any of our questions. It did say that it's working to ensure books within the board are culturally responsive, inclusive, and diverse. Okay, so more questions there. I, one thing that struck me watching this is, you know, stories come from all sorts of places, but where did this one come from? So my colleague and I both worked on it. We are with the Enterprise Unit at CBC here in Toronto, and we actually got an email tip from a student who was concerned, quite concerned about all of this. The student told us that they learned about it from a concerned teacher. So the student brought uh, the information to us, sent us some photos. Of course, we asked a lot of follow-up questions. Uh, they gave us the information for the Libraries Not Landfill group. So we tracked down the organizer, and then you're put in touch with all kinds of people, and things kind of start going from there. All right, there's clearly more to do on this. Certainly. Angelina King, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me.
And another story we're working on, how the dangerous art of storm chasing can shed new light on climate change. We are currently in between this complex of storms and a whole lot of boundaries and new storms that are going up. Storm chasers live to follow monster weather events, and some warn climate change is making those storms more dangerous. Well, you got the extreme dry temperatures that uh, come in and really cause problems. The National breaks down how. But next, a Canadian teen hits the video game Big Leagues. It was really exciting. I never expected this to actually happen. How this 13-year-old struck a deal with Sony in our moment. So this is a trailer for a new video game coming out on PlayStation 5. But here's the best part. It was entirely developed by a 13-year-old from British Columbia. So Max Trest of BC is too young to vote or drive, but his video game career is already blasting off into the stratosphere. The tech prodigy is our moment. I'm Max, I'm 13 years old, and I'm an indie game developer with my own game studio. I started working on Astralander a few years ago. It was originally just a small hobby project, but now it's coming exclusively to PlayStation 5. So when I was originally developing the game, I was exhibiting at a few events to get feedback on the demo. And while I was at one of these events, Seattle Indies Expo, um, I met the PlayStation team. They liked the game so much that they decided that they would offer me the chance to bring it to PlayStation 5. It was really exciting. I never expected this to actually happen. Um, I thought this was just going to be a small release on PC Steam. It's just amazing. So the Cyberquacks are, have stolen the most valuable programs, uh, MVPs, and you have to rescue them from the giant uh, rubber ducks with laser eyes. You can just go side go. We'll just go sideways. I received so much positive feedback and help from the community. They love the game so much, and then when they find out it's developed by a 13-year-old, they're just really shocked and amazed. I started game development when, when I was around six years old. It really is a dream come true. Never give up, always follow your dreams, and you can do anything. 13, he's 13. Max, you are incredible. Apparently what, one of the very cool things about this video game is that it uses the DualSense controller. So you get physical feedback when you push the buttons uh, and, and triggers and whatnot. And of course, Max is already working on a sequel, as you do. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.